Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, whenever someone asked my father who he worked for, he would often answer, I work for the mechanic down the street. You're a mechanic, people would ask, often confused, because they would see my dad wearing a suit and tie. And he said, oh no, I'm not a mechanic. I work at Macy's department store selling shoes I have for many years. But when my truck runs, it seems all my money is going to him. So I really work for the mechanic down the street. If I were to ask you, who do you work for, how would you respond? Would you say you work for Kraft or 3M for Quick Trip? Would you say you work for St. John's or St. Paul's or Martin Luther College? Would you say, I don't work yet, I'm a student? Maybe you would answer differently, I work for my family. I do what I do to provide for them, to bring home the bacon. Maybe you would answer cynically like my dad, and you would say, I work for the mechanic, or I work for the bank who holds the notes to my home. But I'm hoping that all of you could, with a bigger picture, answer with all sincerity that who you really work for is Jesus. Those other jobs just pay the bills while you work for him. This evening, we're encouraged to follow Jesus. We follow him in his word, but we follow him especially to the cross first, where we see what he's done for us for all the times we failed to follow him in his law. But then we're called to follow him and in thanks for the cross, get to work for him, to follow him to go fishing. Because you and I have a nobler, higher calling than just making widgets or selling shoes or pushing papers across a desk. Every one of us is called to work for Jesus and for his kingdom. Our gospel lesson for this evening is recorded for us in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 4, beginning at the 12th verse. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea, along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been imprisoned. It was time for him to pick up where John had left off. He set up his headquarters in Capernaum, and from there he went around teaching the people and preaching the same message that John had preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. But at the same time, Jesus knew that his ministry would only last a short three years, and so he knew he was going to have to pass the torch himself. And so he trained his disciples and he called them to follow him. Tonight, we focus especially on the last six verses of our gospel lesson, beginning at 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Peter and Andrew and John, at least, already knew who Jesus was. They had already been following him in a certain sense. When they had gone south to the Jordan River to hear John preach, they heard John point to Jesus and point him out as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Two of them, Andrew, not Andrew, yes, Andrew, sorry, and John, spent the day with Jesus then, learning from him, asking questions of him. Andrew, in turn, went and told his brother Simon, and Simon came to meet Jesus. And that day already, Jesus renamed him Peter. And so in the broad sense of the word, they were already Jesus' disciples. But 
walking around and listening to Jesus didn't pay the bills. And so they soon went back to their fishing. They went back to the sea and back to their nets, back to Zebedee and back to work. On this particular day, on this one day, Jesus would completely change everything for them because he called them now to leave behind their old jobs and to have a new job. Now they would be disciples of him. They would be disciples in that narrow sense as they followed and learned from the master. They didn't look for the job. They didn't sign up or apply for apprentice to the savior of the world. And they certainly didn't seem qualified for such a position. They weren't rabbis or teachers of the law or priests. Pharisees. We have no indication that they were very well educated or as well versed in the scriptures as the scribes were. We're not told they had any special qualities or skills that these men possessed in order to become Jesus' disciples. They were just fishermen, the factory workers of that day. They caught the fish, they cleaned the fish, they sold the fish, all putting in an honest day's work for an honest dollar when they didn't seek a job with Jesus. Jesus sought them out. And it didn't matter that they weren't qualified because Jesus would qualify them. He would train them. He would give them the skills and the gifts that they needed. He says, I will make you fishers of men. And friends, he's done the exact same thing for us. Whether you work at a factory or at a school, whether you have a four your salary or a six-figure salary, whether your collar is white or blue when you go to work, all of us here really work Jesus. You don't have to leave your boat or your job or your friends or your family in order to do it, but this mission of fishing for people has now fallen to you and to me. John passed the torch to Jesus, who in turn passed the torch to his disciples, who throughout the centuries had passed it down, and now it's ours. It is our task to share the message of God's law and gospel with others of sin and grace. Jesus has no plan B. So how well do we do? Do you have that same passion of Jesus? Who went out of his way to look for opportunities to talk to people? Do you look for even awkward situations where you have to share the message that has been entrusted to you to intentionally put yourself out there? To share with others that message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Or are you content to put a few dollars in the plate, offer a quick prayer up to heaven, and then think, ah, oh, now my job is done. I'll leave the rest to the professionals. I've done my part in sharing the message of God's love. Now I can go back to the couch where I'm comfortable. I can go back to my show on Netflix. I can go back to my hobby. I can go back to my fishing. Can you imagine if you had a six-figure salary at a job where you had been well-trained and you were qualified for, your boss told you clearly what the expectations were, but you just didn't do it? If every time he came into the office he found you sleeping at your desk, do you think you'd get a promotion? No, you'd likely get fired. Friends, for failing to follow Jesus' example, for failing to follow him and his word, for failing to follow his commands and his laws, we don't deserve a promotion. We don't even deserve a demotion. We deserve to be fired forever in the eternity of hell. So follow Jesus. First to the cross. What a blessing those first disciples had. Now, don't get me wrong, I think the pastors you have are pretty awesome. But can you imagine having Jesus as your pastor? Can you imagine learning the word of God from the Son of God himself? Can you imagine the opportunity they had to see the miracles firsthand? To see the resurrected Jesus stand before them, to have the Holy Spirit come down and rest on them with those tongues of fire. Yes, Jesus would train them well and adequately for the job that they had. They had great on-the-job training. Nevertheless, I would contend with you 
that you and I have something even better. You see, our training manual is complete. There are no chapters missing for us. With the whole New Testament spelling out so clearly what Jesus' work has done for us and what we are called to do in thanks, we have it all very clear. We understand what it means to repent and have a change of mind about our sin, about our greatest need. We know what it means when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near. We know that his rule would begin with his victory over sin, death, and hell as he died on the cross to bring about that victory for us. We know that he didn't mean a political rule, but that his rule, his kingdom is in our hearts as by faith we put our trust in him. And as we follow Jesus to the cross and to the empty tomb, in a sense, we've had a Pentecost of our own as the Holy Spirit has enlightened us, strengthened our faith, and assures us that we are forgiven for every sin and promises that heaven is ours one day soon. Talk about a raise. And friends, it is this gospel message that fills our hearts with such overwhelming gratitude that we are eager to follow Jesus then, to get to work for him, and to go fishing. Think for a moment of the tough choice that those first disciples had to leave everything behind. Family and friends, a lucrative business, even health to follow Jesus. Think of the tough job that they would do to proclaim this message that people were sinners, that Jesus was the only way to get to heaven, and that often to a very hostile crowd. Think of the compensation that they would receive for this new job, not a six-figure salary, but abuse, mockery, and in the end, even torture and death. You might think the disciples would say, well, Jesus, thanks for the offer, but I think I'll stick to fishing. Or at the very least, Jesus, we appreciate that you would consider us for the job. Could we have a couple days to think about it? But that's not what they said. That's not what they did. No, we're told at once they left their nets and followed him. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. In an instant, they made this life-altering decision Take the boat. I won't be needing it anymore. Ah, forget about the business and the wealth that it would have brought. Sorry, Dad, but we're out of here. Catch you later. But how could they do it? What prompted them to leave everything behind, to take on this difficult, thankless, painful job that lay ahead of them? Well, you know the answer. Only one thing can motivate in this way. The gospel. Because they already knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They already knew that he was their Savior. And it was this truth that gave them the desire and the strength and the courage to leave it all behind and follow him. Pardon the pun, but they were hooked. They had no other choice. And after witnessing the resurrection... After experiencing what they did on the day of Pentecost, then they were even emboldened to be willing to be tortured and killed for Jesus. Friends, it is the same gospel that motivates and empowers us to get to work for Jesus. And thanks for the forgiveness that we have from the Lamb of God who's taken away the sin of the world, who's taken away our sin, for that light that shone in our darkness, we are eager to serve him. And to get to work for him. You don't have to quit your job and enter the full-time ministry as those first disciples did. You can continue to work at Craft or 3M, at Quick Trip, at the farm, or at your school. But that's really only what you do to pay the bills while you really work for Jesus. And that work, the same for us as it was for them. For John the Baptist, for Peter and Andrew and James and John, our Work and tell them to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Preach sin, preach grace, preach Jesus. Support that work with your generous gifts and your regular prayers, and go fishing yourself. 
Not in Sleepy Eye Lake or Lake Hanska. Not in the Cottonwood or Minnesota rivers. Go fishing in your families, among your coworkers, in your community. Go fishing for people. Tomorrow kicks off Lutheran Schools Week. And what a great time to renew our zeal to fish for people as we first follow Jesus ourselves. Follow him in the word. Follow him to the cross and follow him to the empty tomb. Follow Jesus in worship and Bible class and Sunday school and grow in your faith. And then you'll be full of a zeal that's eager to get to work for him. Follow him to go fishing. Help others to hear of the message of sin and grace. Help those here at St. John's, at St. Paul's Lutheran School, at Minnesota Valley Lutheran High School, and at Martin Luther College. Help them with your gifts, and with your prayers, with your participation in their lives, and with your words of encouragement to them. Help them to follow Jesus, that we all might get to work for him and go fishing for people. Who do you work for? We all work for Jesus. And thanks for the work that he did for us. We follow him to the cross. We follow him to go fishing. In Jesus' name, dear friends, amen. Please stand. And may our Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen.